basically introducing a nonlinear element to you and lo looking at how this affects what we do in terms of circuit analysis. So in the, um, early in the course, we talked about why we need actually uh, nonlinear elements. Uh, so it's, again, helpful to just remind ourselves what we want, that we're getting ourselves into so much trouble. You know, analysis of nonlinear circuits is, is more difficult for sure. And uh, things sometimes uh, may not feel that tangible compared to electric circuits. So why are we going through all that issues? Uh, so a couple of examples that I can bring up or, or hopefully refresh your memory is we cannot do rectification with a linear element. Rectification means that you only keep the positive or negative uh, information of, in terms of you know, the value of a signal and discard the rest. You cannot do that with a linear circuit. The linear circuit is going to respond the same to the positive and negative signals. You cannot have any amplification, actually. This is very important. We, uh, when we talk about amplifiers, in most cases, we look at them as linear elements. We say, let's say, the output of this amplifier is 10 times its input. 10 is the gain of the amplifier. But in order to have that amplification happen, you have to have a nonlinear element sitting in between the two inputs. Yes, you may have uh, linearized its operation. Yes, maybe it is behaving like a linear device in a certain, around a certain operating region, but it's actually a nonlinear element. And the reason that you need a nonlinear element is that, uh, you know, the signal that comes in, let's say from this microphone, and goes through a speaker, you have to have a gain of a thousand or something like that in between. And the energy that the microphone has received from my sound signal is much, much, much less than the energy that is required to uh, drive the speaker, right? So in that case, well, where does that energy come from? If the amplifier sitting in between them is a linear element, it cannot increase the energy of your signal. Remember, it's not a source. It's not a voltage source or, or a current source. It's not an independent source. It's a dependent source. So it takes something at the input, some signal coming in, let's say uh, one milliwatt of energy, uh, power comes in, and it drives it to a speaker that is putting out, I don't know, 10 watts, right? So that factor of 10,000 increase in um, energy level, in power level, should come from somewhere. So the amplifier that is sitting between the speaker and the microphone takes actually that energy from the power supply, let's say a DC power supply, and converts it into an AC uh, additional AC power for your signal. That kind of a transformation, taking energy from DC and putting it in an AC, uh, adding it to an AC signal, that you cannot do with a linear element. Uh, some smarter ones uh, may, or the ones that remember electric circuits a bit better, may say, that, what about transformers? Transformers are linear devices. You can have a one-to-n ratio at the input and output, and the output voltage is n times larger than the input voltage. Uh, you know, can't you use a transformer as an amplifier? And uh, I'm going to let those people figure it out. And if you cannot figure it out by our live session, ask me during the live session. The question here is, can you use a transformer as an amplifier? I'll give you the answer, no. Because if that was the case, the whole uh, um, industry of analog electronic analog amplifier design would be basically pointless. But think about why not. Why cannot I use a transformer as a amplifier, as a signal amplifier? The other thing you cannot do is that you cannot, for example, multiply signals by each other. And then we saw in the example that we had in the last lecture, first lecture that uh, sometimes you want to up-convert the frequency of a signal. You have a low-frequency signal, you want to go up from, let's say, kilohertz range to gigahertz range. And in a case like that, what we did is that we took advantage of what we knew about sine waves and how they behave, and we multiplied the signals by each other. If you multiply two sine waves, their frequencies add up. And that's how we did the uh, transformation from low frequency to high frequency. But with a linear element, you cannot do that. In linear elements, the frequencies of input signals and output signals are always the same. You may have a little bit of delay. You may have a little bit of phase shift between them, but the frequencies are always the same. A sine wave that goes in produces a sine wave of the same frequency at the output. Uh, 
Here is another thing you cannot do with linear elements. You cannot do any wave shaping, any wave forming, right? So if, if the sine wave goes in, the sine wave comes out. Um, but how do I convert that sine wave into a square wave if I wanted to? You may be able to go from more complicated waveforms down to sine waves, right? So if I have a square wave, maybe I can use a low-pass filter, get rid of the higher harmonics, and produce something that looks like a sine wave. But going up the other way is not easy, or maybe it's impossible. You know, if you have a single frequency input coming in, let's say a sine wave coming in, I cannot create more complicated uh, waveforms at the output than that sine wave. And then more importantly, or actually something that should be close to your heart, is that you cannot do logic operations if everything was linear. You all know about digital logic or have some familiarity with digital electronics. Everything is about zeros and ones, nothing in between. A linear circuit changes continuously, moves continuously between values. So if your circuit is jumping between zeros and ones all the time, as it happens in digital electronics, you definitely need some nonlinear components to do the processing for you, to do uh, the calculations for you. So we need nonlinear elements. And then from this point onwards, uh, we are going to talk about nonlinear devices uh, for, let's say, the remaining 70% of the time, 80% of the time. The last 20% we come back to linearized components, still nonlinear devices. So the first device that I'm going to talk about as an example of a nonlinear device is a diode. This is the symbol for a diode. This is the convention for the voltage drop and current through the diode. So the direction of the current is the same as the direction of the arrow on the symbol. And the voltage drop is measured between the anode, I named the terminals, and cathode of the diode. It's a nonlinear device. So it actually uh, responds to positive and negative voltages differently. Not all nonlinear devices are like that. So if you have, for example, a device whose nonlinearity is cubic, x cubed, it behaves the same to positive, uh, responds the same way to positive and negative values. But diode is not like that. So we have indications of direction here. You can see the arrow here. Um, let me see if I can maybe highlight it. The arrow here points out to the direction of the current. This is how the current should flow through the diode. And with that taken in, uh, in mind, I define the voltage drop across the diode as shown here. So remember that we said you always choose the value of the current or the direction of the current and the direction of the potentials arbitrarily in circuits. Uh, for these electronic devices, we stick to convention. So that's how I define V diode, and that's how I expect ID to flow through the diode. So I have an anode, a cathode, and that's it. So, how does a diode behave? I'm going to talk about an ideal diode now. It has an interesting behavior. For an ideal diode, behave, let me just try it maybe as. behaves differently based on the voltage current uh, uh, values. Behaves, well, one, or let's say point 0.1, bullet point 0.1, as a short circuit if Vd is larger than zero. And I, there is a little bit of discrepancy here that I'll come back. Or as an open circuit, if Vd is less than zero, right? So depending on the value of Vd, and actually we're going to see that this is not really a good uh, 
way to divide these two operating regions from each other. If VD tends to become positive, then it's, it's a short circuit. It just connects the anode and cathode nodes in your circuit to each other, and it behaves like a short circuit. And if that happens, you know, that, here's the issue here. If that happens, then VD is zero, right? So you will never have a positive VD, right? So, but the point here is that if VD tends to be larger than zero, then the two nodes connect to each other, you will have a short circuit. And remember, ID flows in the direction shown only. You cannot flow back into the diode. You know, the path of the current going back here is blocked. It only lets the current flow one way. And if VD is negative, then you have an open circuit. So basically, you can take this diode out of your circuit, you replace it with an open circuit, and then you solve it if you know that VD is going to be negative. Now, uh, as I said, you cannot have a positive VD here for an ideal diode because if VD becomes a tiniest amount larger than zero, you will have a short circuit, and from that point onwards, VD will always be zero. If I want to draw the input-output characteristic curve or IV characteristic curve for the ideal diode, let's just say um, this is ID versus VD, it's going to look like this. For all the negative voltages, I have zero current, so I'm going to be lying on this axis. As soon as the voltage tends to become positive, your current, your voltage drop will be zero. You will have a short circuit. So this is a short circuit. Basically, what does that mean? You can have any value of current without any voltage drop. And over here, you have an open circuit. Any value of voltage without any current going through the diode. You can think of a diode as a pipe where, you, let's say, you have a flap here. And this flap, let's say, is held in place using a weak spring. So let's just say a very weak spring holds it in place. And if you have a f structure like this, the current flows only in one direction, right? The current flows that way. But as soon as it wants to push back, uh, let's say the flap blocks the, the direction of the flow. On the positive side from left to right, the spring is weak enough that it relatively easily opens and let the current go through that pipe. So think about, you can think about an ideal diode as a one-way pipe. Now, with that understanding, let's have a look at a couple of diode circuits. So let's look at a circuit, simple circuit like this. I put a, so one thing that is a bit inconvenient in that IV characteristic curve, as you can see, is that nothing really limits my current. I don't have too much of a problem with open circuit voltages, they don't cause too much damage. Remember, this is electronics. You know, your power supply is a 3-volt battery or, or, let's say, a 9-volt battery at max if you're uh, rich. Um, so it's like 9 volts. And with electronics, you know, if you don't have inductors and some other funny uh, components in your circuit, under normal conditions, I would say 99.9% .9 of conditions, all the voltages that are produced in your circuit are going to be between your largest supply voltage, let's say 9, and ground. So everything is between 0 and 9. So I don't really care too much about that open circuit voltage. You know, if it is 5 or 6 or 2, whatever that lies in between, is not really going to cause a lot of damage. It's not probably going to harm my devices. I'm, I'm not too concerned about it. But a lot of current can go through a path that is let's say, has very, very little resistance. So, and that, I mean a lot by that, right? So you, you, you know, for example, in the car battery, you only have 12 volts, but that 12 volt battery is producing hundreds of amps once you need to start a car. Um, if you short circuit a one and a half volt battery at home, and if you do it under dark conditions, you can actually see sparks fly, right? There, are, there is going to be a lot of current even if the voltage drop is small. That lot of current causes a bunch of issues. First of all, you know, I may damage something uh, somewhere, you know, things can get hit up, and, um, uh, you know, I, I can actually create a hazardous situation. And it also drains my battery very, very quickly. So I usually am not too comfortable with devices that turn into short circuits on their own. So I, I usually want to limit uh, 
that short circuit current somehow. So the first circuit that I'm going to analyze here is this. So let's say we have a circuit that uses a resistor to limit the current. I have a voltage source and a diode here. And this is my circuit, right? Or I can stick to the electronic convention, get rid of that loop, put a ground connection here, a ground connection here. And let's say I want to study how V out changes as I increase V in. And this resistor here is there only to limit the current when the diode turns on. I don't want to have an infinite amount of current drawn from my uh, resistor. So I want to analyze this circuit. You know, remember KVL and KCL always hold. So I can write my KVL saying that V in is equal to RI plus, uh, let's say, this is going to be my VD, which is the same as V out. I'm going to write it as ID and VD, right? So this is ID, and I have only one loop. So ID goes through the diode as well as the resistor and VD. This is my KVL. Notice that I have two variables here. I don't know VD or ID, right? And how I figure out those values, you need another uh, equation to uh, basically two variables. You need at least two equations to solve them. And you need to come up with another equation here to give you the value for VD and ID. We'll see how to do it later on, but for now, what I do is that I go back to this IV characteristic curve. I say, okay, so I'll try to figure out based on this characteristic curve, IV characteristic, uh, what should those values be. And in this case, for this problem, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go from a very large negative value for EV in. So very large negative value depends on the context, but let's say it could be from minus 10, minus 100, minus a million, right? But from a very large negative value, start sweeping that voltage up and see what happens to my circuit. And I want to draw the characteristic curve here. For example, I want to know that if I have this graph I'm changing V in, and I'm plotting V out. I want to see what happens, right? If I go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and those values, again, depend on the context. So case one, let's say V in is a very large negative value, minus infinity, right? Minus 100, minus 10, depends on the context, as I said. If that's the case, then you notice that I will have a more positive voltage at this end of my circuit, right, this end of my circuit, than this end, right? So the voltage on the left side of the resistor will be more negative than the voltage on the right side of the resistor. If that's the case, and I know for a resistor V is equal to IR, then the current through the resistor should flow in this direction. Right? More negative voltage on the left side, the current should go towards the more negative voltage. And what is going to happen? Well, the diode that I have in that loop will not like it. The diode will block the current. The current cannot go up in the diode and through the resistor. And therefore, the diode will put the circuit in, uh, will be in an open circuit mode or region if the diode is off, when the uh, current through a diode is zero, when it is behaving as an open circuit, we say the diode is off. If the current through the diode is non-zero, if the diode is conducting some current, we'll say the diode is on. The diode is off, therefore, the first thing that I know from that is ID will be zero, right? And then what is V out? Well, if ID is zero, there is no voltage drop across R, I can see right away from here, from this equation, uh, that V out will be equal to V in. So for very large negative voltages, V out and V in will be equal, right? The diode is replaced with an open circuit. There is no voltage drop across the resistor, zero current. 
and v out and v in will be equal. So uh, let's say um, we are going to be for very large negative voltages, this is going to look like this. This characteristic curve look like, looks like this. And as long as the diode is off, this is going to be the situation, right? It doesn't matter what the input voltage is, minus 5, minus 10, minus a million. As long as the diode is off, there's no current, output and input will be zero, it will be equal. So that actually is a slope of 1. Now, how long will that happen? Well, for all negative voltages, that situation is going to be the same. As soon as we reach zero, something interesting will happen. So for all negative voltages, nothing is going to change. Ugh. So this continues all the way to zero. As soon as you hit zero, something interesting happens. Now, as soon as your V-in goes slightly positive, right? Now you have zero voltage here, now you have a slightly more positive here, voltage here. The voltage on the left side of the resistor can now be more positive than the voltage on the right side of it. So the current, if everything else is okay, can actually flow in this direction. Will that be possible? Well, yes. Your diode will be happy to accommodate that current. The current can flow through the diode and your diode will be in on state. As soon as it is on, what that means is that it behaves as a short circuit. So while in this case, I'm going to draw the equivalent circuit. In this case, you are dealing with this circuit, V in R, and the diode is open circuit here. When V in becomes larger than zero, right? You're dealing with a new circuit. Your diode behaves as a short circuit, so I'm going to draw the diode here, but as a short circuit this time. And this is your V in. And guess what? V out goes to zero. So I don't even actually have to solve this. I can see it right away in that circuit that with the short circuit for the diode, V out goes to zero. So if I want to go and plot this curve or complete this curve for all positive values that's what I will have. V out is zero for positive voltages and uh, V out is equal to V in for negative voltages. So here's what you can see that you know we actually were dealing with two different circuits depending on the operating region of the diode which is dependent uh, depend that on the value of the input voltage source you may have a diode that is on or off. In either case, you're dealing with a new circuit. In one case, it was an open circuit there. So uh, in other case, it was a short circuit. But once you knew the operating region of the, the diode, you're dealing with a linear circuit. The remaining is a linear circuit. You could solve it relatively easily, at least in this case. Uh, and this is going to repeat in all of these uh, future lectures for us, right? So you're going to have different operating regions. And if you figure out the operating region of the um, nonlinear elements in your circuit, in most cases you can actually go and simplify the circuit and, and solve and figure out what the output voltage should be. Now, let's flip things a bit and look at the circuit. Well, actually it's the same circuit, but I'm going to look at it uh, in a uh, different way. Now I'm going to choose a slightly different configuration here. I put the diode up here now. The resistor down here. Again, remember I have a loop here, but I'm not going to draw the loops anymore. Right? So at least between the common uh, nodes. This is my diode. This is V out. And the question stays the same. What is the uh, characteristic curve for this uh, circuit? Meaning that, you know, I, if I change V in as my independent variable, how does V out respond to it? And we can go through the same analysis that we did before. Uh, you know, for negative voltages, as you have a negative, let's say, input, you can say that, okay, the voltages on the left side of the circuit tend to be more negative than the right side. 
So the current through the resistor should be, if that's the case, going up. But my diode will not like that, and my diode will block that current. So for negative voltages, the diode is an open circuit, and V out for V in less than zero, V out will be zero, right? Because the current is zero, I have an open circuit, so this is, um, uh, let me draw the circuit maybe here. So this is my circuit. The diode is an open circuit, and V out will be zero. For V in larger than zero, now the current wants to flow in this direction. The diode will be happy to accommodate that, and you have this new circuit. And this is the same as what we saw before, right? So just the same analysis, same type of uh, arguments here, and... So for V in lower, less than zero, V out, let me just write it in blue here, V out will be zero. For V in larger than zero, V out will be equal to V in, right? The short circuit uh, for the diode makes V out the same as V in. And if I want to plot the input-output relationship or characteristic curve, this is how it's going to look like. V in, V out. For negative V in, V out is zero. And for positive V in, V out is equal to V in. Goes through the origin with the slope of one. Now, yeah, I analyzed the circuit again to come up with that characteristic curve. But you could also come up with this characteristic curve from here, right? And I'd like you to think about it and how I can go from here, the voltage across the diode in this case was what we were after. In this circuit, it is the voltage across the resistor. And I already have solved that circuit. How could have I come up with this characteristic curve here? I'd like to think about, I'd like you guys to think about it for a bit at home and see that, you know, or basically convince yourself that I really didn't have to solve the circuit again. I could have used what I had over there and draw the characteristic curve here. And uh, the key word to that solution, or at least one way of convincing yourself that uh, the case is KVL. But uh, anyway, I leave it for you guys to practice at home. And this is V in, V out characteristic curve. Now, somebody may say, you know, what does this mean? You know, this V in is arbitrarily changing from a very negative voltage to a very positive voltage. This never happens in practice. In practice, you have fixed voltages at some point, or uh, varying voltages with time. And you're dealing with those kinds of voltages. What's the point of this? The point here is that if you have this characteristic curve, it actually makes your life much, much easier. As soon as you know what the range of the input is, you can go and figure out what the output voltage for be, will be, right? So if your V in is here, a DC voltage, you can go and say V out should be here. Or if your V in is negative, you can right away say that your V out should be that much. However, that's not really the whole point. Remember, you know, these are nonlinear circuits now, right? So it's not, sometimes you may not even have expressions for um, all these V out values. You know, you may not have a closed form expression for that. So a curve helps in understanding, uh, you know, what are the ranges of these voltages and things like that. Uh, but the situation actually is more interesting when you're dealing with devices or signals that are varying in time. So let me look at a sine wave here. Let's say V in is a sine wave like that. And uh, um, let me use a little bit of color here now that we can. Okay, so this is your typical sine wave, and this is V. And I'm going to plot V out on the same curve. For V out, I'm going to use red. So this is V out. 
Now, you have applied V in as a sine wave to this circuit. You want to know how V out will look like. Well, there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, for example, you can look at the equations that we have on the left side, and you say, okay, so for this first half cycle, V out is positive. Let me draw that maybe at the bottom here, just below the main waveform. So for the... Um, so this is V out. I'm going to draw V out here. For positive values of V in, that goes all the way to, let's say, this is T, this is going to be T over 2. One period or, or half a period, right? And this is 3 over 2 and all that. Uh, for the positive values of V in, V out will be equal to V in, so this is what I will have. Right? It follows the input waveform. But between uh, T over 2 and T, where V in is negative, V out will be 0. And then I will have the positive half cycle and then zero, and then so on and so forth. So what you can see here is that this circuit is doing something very interesting for me. It clips the negative part of the signal. This is actually a very useful function. We'll see uh, applications of this later on in this chapter. But uh, you can already see that, right? How could I come up with this waveform over here? You know, if you want, you can use the graph that you have plotted, you can say that, you know, V in, well, obviously the variations are like this, right? Uh, and then if you have those kinds of variations for V in, you can map them onto this plot, right? You can say this is going to plot there, this is here, this is here, this is here. The negative values fall over here. And you can just go and figure out what should be the positive, uh, the output of this circuit. So if the variations of V in are like this. The variations of V out are going to be like that, right? So from here, you have goes up to here and then down and then negative, okay? So I can use that <coughs> uh, characteristic curve to quickly figure out how your input signal falls into different operating regions of this device or how it is affecting them and then um, uh, figure out, at least create a, an initial image of how the output signal should look like. Now, we said this circuit has a lot of applications. We'll talk about rectification later on in the course. Uh, but one of the immediate applications, as you can see here, is that I can use this circuit to figure out the strength of my input signal. And what I need to do is that I um, take my sine wave, feed it to a diode resistive circuit like this, and you can show that, you know, the out looks like this. If you go and calculate the average of this signal at the output, so the average of this signal is probably going to fall something like this, right? So let's call it V average. The average of that signal, the DC value of that signal, is going to be proportional to the peak of that sine wave. So if this sine wave has a peak value of, let's say, Vp here, V average will be proportional to that. And you can use that, the average of that signal, as an indicator of the signal strength. Uh, so V average, so in order to calculate V average, you go over one period from 0 to T, divided by period, and you integrate the signal, so V out dt, right? And if I do that, well, I notice that I only have a signal during the first half of that period, so it's going to be 1 over t, so from 0 to t over 2, it's going to be, let's say, Vp sine omega t dt plus from t over 2 to t, well, the output is 0, so it's 0 dt, right? And if you calculate this, at the end of the story, you see the value, the integral, is going to be vp over pi, if you do the math. So you can feed an AC signal into this circuit and get a DC value of vp over pi that uh, tells you what the average of this signal is or what the peak of this signal is. You know, just multiply it by pi, and you get the signal amplitude. And I cannot do that directly on that AC signal. I cannot really 
you know, whenever you use one of these AC voltmeters that tell you the magnitude of the signal, uh, the AC signal, well, they are not telling you how they're doing it. This is how they do it. They convert that AC information, the amplitude information in your AC signal, into a DC signal first. They measure that DC signal, and if you have a sine wave, what they do is that they multiply it by pi to give you the amplitude information. So right away, you have an application for a nonlinear circuit. Now, um, in order to solve diode circuits, so what we've seen so far is that you first have to figure out if the diode is on or off, if it is behaving as a short circuit or an open circuit, right? And <coughs> once you figure that part out, um, it's, the analysis is fairly simple. You can actually go ahead and uh, um, use the short circuit. You, if you have one diode, you will have a linear circuit left over, or use the open circuit and solve the circuit as such. So let's just go through one example here and see uh, what we need to do in order to solve a basic circuit like this with two diodes now. With one diode, life is too easy. Okay, so here is the circuit that we want to analyze. We want to figure out, for example, what is the value of this current. Let's just say the question is what is I, let me see, in your, yeah, ID2. The question is that what is ID2, right? Or the other question you may have is, yeah, let's just do it this way maybe. What is V out as measured from that node? Okay, so the question is, what is V out in this circuit? And, uh, you know, we have a nonlinear circuit. <coughs> we know that if we can figure out what the operating region of the uh, device is, we can actually solve the circuit relatively easily. But we don't know, right? With these kind of limited values, if it was minus infinity or plus infinity, those voltages, you know, it might have been easy. But right now, it's not really that clear to us what those voltages and currents might be. So to solve this circuit, I need to make a guess. I need to guess whether D1 and D2 are going to be on or off, solve the circuit, and check for inconsistencies in my assumption. So it's an initial assumption that I have that, let's say, D1 and D2 are both on. If I assume that, I replace them with a the short circuit, solve the circuit. I can solve the circuit now. It's a linear circuit, simple. Uh, and I go and check if the initial assumption would hold. So let's go through that here. So I'm going to assume, let's say, uh, for the sake of just keeping with uh, the, the, the statements, I'm going to assume that D1 is on and D2 is also on. OK? So if that's the case, this circuit simplifies to this. I replace. D1 with the short circuit here, and D2 with the short circuit here. The rest of the circuit stays the same, right? So this is, I'm going to call this ID1. Maybe I just draw something here to remind myself that there was a diode. Here it's not a typical short circuit. And this is ID2, and this is the voltage that I'm interested in right above uh, 
the second diode. So this is 5 kilo ohms, minus 10, and 10 kilo ohms here. And this was plus 10 volts. Okay? So if I make the assumption that both diodes are on, I uh, reduce the circuit to this. Quickly, I can solve this circuit. First of all, I can see that V out is zero. Because if you look at this circuit, I have a short circuit to ground here, and same thing over here. So V out will be zero. That's, uh, you know, right away I have the value for V out. I'm not done yet. I need to see if the assumption that I made at the beginning holds true. I may very well be wrong. So I have solved the circuit, but I'm not done because I haven't checked this assumption. This, remember, is just an assumption at the very beginning. I don't know if that assumption is true. So this is, I'm going to write, assume D1 on and D2 on. Now, check the assumption. Check assumption. So how do I check? If a diode is on, the current through it in the proper direction should be non-negative, right? It could be zero, but it should definitely not be negative. So these currents, ID1 and ID2, which are the same in that graph here, should be positive. So ID1, let's calculate ID2 here. In this case, it's easier. ID2 is the voltage, is the current that goes through this 10K resistor. I have 10 volts up there, 0 volts at the bottom of the resistor. So ID2 is 10 minus 0 divided by the resistor value, 10 kilo ohm, and that gives you 1 milliamps. Okay? ID2, sorry, ID1 over here, this uh, current through the 5K resistor, let's just call it I, is going to be ID1 plus ID2. But I is easy, so let's just call it, let's say, I1. I1 is easy to calculate because it's the current to the resistor. I know the voltage drop across resistor. So let's just calculate I1 first. I1 is 0 minus, minus 10 divided by 5K, and that's 2 milliamps. Okay, so this resistor, this current, uh, I1 is the voltage, you can find it by f knowing the voltage drop across that 5K resistor. But I already know that I1 from KCL is equal to ID2 plus ID1. And knowing ID2, I can see that ID1, therefore, is 1 milliamp. So ID2 is larger than 0, so D2 is on. ID1, I calculated here is larger than zero, so D1 is on. And therefore, my assumption holds true. What I assumed at the beginning that both diodes are on seems to be the case. Now, let's look at the same circuit, but slightly different voltages, so, or different configurations. So in this case, I'm going to put the 10K resistor down here, going to minus 10 volts the other diode over here, but I switch the resistor here as well. I will have a 5K resistor up there, D1, D2, and my objective is still to find V out, right? Same circuit, I just put the resistors upside down compared to the other one. Now, in this case, what happens is that, again, you can make the assumption You know, it looks like it's the same as before, so you can make an assumption that D1 is on and D2 is on, and go and solve the circuit. And if you do that, so this is ID1 and ID2, we will have the same circuit as before. I'm not going to redraw that circuit again. But you can show that ID2 has to be 2 milliamps and ID1 has to be 1 milliamp. Just because if you have short circuits for two diodes, you have a ground potential in between them. So 0 volt at the top of minus uh, 10K resistor and minus 10 at the bottom, so that's 1 milliamp. Um, 
for uh, that resistor for the 5k resistor you have 10 volts at the top 0 at the bottom and ID2 gives you 2 milliamps 